I don't know what ACID stands for. But... Okay. Well, it's not often that one has the privilege of introducing one's colleague from thousands of miles away. So I'll try to do justice to the many talents of uh, Munshad Ali. Uh, he's been at MIT for 25 years. Yeah. Uh, he is, uh, his early work was on the so-called Elburn problem, namely the designing compensators where the optimization criterion is an L1 norm. And that was part of his thesis and remained an open problem. And one of the contenders to control system design contend us to the age infinity. But I think I should say more about what's going on at MIT uh, these days, and in particular, of which uh, Munsa certainly has been in, in the leader. I think uh, for many, many years, uh, there's been interest in MIT in bringing, if you like, the engineering sciences and the social sciences together. Uh, I think that's a natural thing to strive for if you're going to be seriously interested in the problems of Indian infrastructure, in health, healthcare, or energy, and so on. There's, of course, interaction between society, human society, and technology. But it's been quite elusive uh, till, I would say, five years back when uh, IDSS, Institute for Data Systems and Society, was formed with the express uh, belief that it, it is possible to make something out of that, uh, about to say, morass of trying to bring these things together. Uh, I think that the result of that has been progress. For example, is there's a new statistics center, there's a PhD program bringing engineering science and social science together. And uh, we have made some superlative appointments at all level. And uh, the fact that you need to understand human interactions is a, is a credit to Munzer, I would say, who's dealt with five deans in five different schools from the School of Science, Engineering, etc., uh, And uh, I think that's what he's going to talk about. <laughs> okay, that's right. Let's just put it over here. Let's put it in my pocket. Okay, uh, thank you Sanjoy for uh, a nice introduction. Uh, uh, just uh, in terms of uh, going back the memory lane, Sanjoy was my mentor when I arrived at MIT in uh, 1987, and uh, I would say he was probably the best mentor out there. Uh, his uh, theme was, uh, don't worry about anything, do your own work and make it good. It was a little bit of pressure. <laughs> I'd like to worry about some other stuff, maybe I can handle, but, you know, but the criteria was very clear at that time, and um, I think what we're trying to do with IDSS is to mimic a lot of the leadership and vision that uh, Sanjo has set out. Uh, thank you for the organizers for giving me a, a chance to speak today. Um, I do want to say, and I mentioned this to one of my colleagues, is that this is the first time where one of my abstracts gets rejected from an invited talk. <laughs> and so the tradition goes on, everything gets rejected, the abstract gets rejected. So my understanding of this particular lecture is that it needs to be higher level and uh, not too technical. My first abstract was quite technical. Um, uh, <laughs> um, there will be some technical aspects to the talk, but I do want to talk a little bit about what Sanjo is uh, alluded to, and that is understanding networks of systems and society, and lead to potentially a message towards the end of how we should be thinking about some of these problems. But I wait until we get to the end to deliver the message. There'll be some aspects that are technical and some aspects that are high level, but 
in case things that you don't follow certain technical aspect, ignore them. Uh, I'll pick up again in just a few minutes after that. And this work has actually been in collaborations with the students, postdocs, and, uh, and faculty collaborators. Um, Anish is sitting here, one of the students. Anish, where are you? There, right here. And then from the postdocs, Ketan is uh, there. And then, of course, Devarat is here. Um, and so, you know, there's at least one representative from every group. In case I mess up, <laughs> someone will can, can correct me. Uh, so this, at least I, I feel I'm covered that way, as exactly what Sri did earlier. Uh, so I kind of learned from my own student. Um, I do want to give you this, uh, for those of you who attended my um, uh, CDC plenary have seen this, but I'm going to give this again. Can't hear the sound, but maybe. Can you? Okay, well done. we're good. Thank you. So I, I think this is an interesting um, example of um, yeah. Okay, move. Um, an example of the fear that we have in the transportation system, namely that uh, congestion get, is going to get to a point where you know, we have to leave the day before in order to get the next day. And, and I think that something that is happening, this is sort of an old picture of congestion, but the picture is not any different. I mean, it's funny that we are in Mumbai here, and, and sometimes it takes more than an hour and a half to get past 10 kilometers, you know? And so this is somewhat un, unmanageable, so to speak, right? And, um, and it's unmanageable because there doesn't seem to be sufficient slack in the system to utilize, right? So you've got, in the United States we have, and I don't, I'm not much familiar with uh, transportation in India, but I would say in the United States, everyone is using some sort of an app uh, for transportation, whether it's the Google map or Waze. Um, and these things are uh, designed to optimize your local, your actual individual pathway but they're not optimized to, for the global welfare. And there are many interesting examples where you, know, you would have a small uh, incident in one road and traffic is routed into a different road and, and, and because of that, a larger congestion is being caused because of this rerouting. And those are not difficult examples to generate. So the, the, the interesting aspect of this problem today is not so much about you know, building new highways, but the information management. So the you know, transportation problems have become more about information than they are about highways and how to build them, or cars and how to build them, right? Although electric cars will play a role as we, we go. Information management has become real because we as people are connected in real time to the state of the system, something that didn't happen before. You have access in real time to the state of the system, and your decisions are based on information provided to you about the state of the system. So as you start thinking about the management of the system, you have to manage the preferences and decisions people make based on the state of the system. Something that we didn't really worry about in, say, what I would say, an operation research approach to congestion management of this area. The electric grid is another example. Sanjay also mentioned that in management of energy in general, the electric grid is one example where um, um, in India, it's a whole different cha challenge, obviously, of thinking about electricity and, and, uh, and increasing the reach. In the United States, this is a problem that is essentially a non-problem. You know, in, at MIT, about, I would say about 10 years ago, we thought this is the area that we should be working on because in 10 years, this is going to be a real issue. 10 years have passed, and it's not a real issue. It's not a real issue because the United States has not made a huge commitment uh, in introducing renewables the same way, I would say, Europe and, and, and the East has. We thought that that's going to move a lot faster. It didn't, you know? But the introduction of renewable resources is going to add a lot of stochasticity to the grid, and many of you, electrical engineers, know that that's actually a real problem in, in sort of matching supply and demand. 
it also has, um, okay, so that's one aspect of this. Uh, so we're still living in the in what I call la-la land uh, in, in the United States because we think everything is okay, but we have um, a problem looming on us, and that is the electric car issue. So, you know, 2025, I would say most of the major car manufacturers have made statements that they will only be producing electric cars. Uh, Mercedes, uh, BMW, Volvo, others, you know, and, and there's a, a trend that kind of propagates among these manufacturers where if one is doing something, everybody starts doing it. So it's possible that we will find ourselves with no other option but having electric cars. Now, if we just imagine uh, a, a 30 to 40 percent penetration of electric cars in the, in the United States, that will change the game entirely in how electricity is being consumed. And all of a sudden, we will be operating at the margins, which means that we will have to be utilizing uh, real-time demand response, redesigning the market uh, for, for electricity, and, and, and obtaining better understanding of the data that people have in terms of their transportation and movement that is connected directly to the power grid, something that is actually going to transform this particular problem. Uh, and the third example that's actually also um, very close to all of this is finance. Um, and finance is a complicated problem, not because in itself is more complicated than the grid, but because a lot of the data that you would like to get, you cannot get. And, and, and that's actually making that space somewhat difficult to penetrate, understanding the robustness and the fragility of that particular system. But certainly, the whole question of um, cascaded failures in the financial system and the dependencies of the different sectors um, clearly is, is an issue. But also the investors, the, the small creditors like us who can react very quickly to a, a signal that may come out from the stock market and, and end up with a run in terms of, the, uh, of, of our investments can actually cause a cascade that, that wasn't necessary. And so, and so all of this stuff make it somewhat um, uh, uh, critical for us to understand the interdependencies and how these systems interact with each other. So a very general comment that I like to give and sort of kind of was the basis of the launch of the Institute for Data Systems and Society is this recognition that you know, maybe two decades ago, the world was separated into two sides, the, the uh, engineers and the scientists on one side and the social scientists on the other side. Engineers thought about physical systems. They used physics and biology to write differential equations, to describe them, to design a control system, to analyze their behavior, and so forth. And they did that quite systematically, going from the data they measure into building models into de developing insights. You've been very skilled in understanding a notion of abstraction in building these models. Um, engineers are very good at this. No model is a real description of the real process. A model is good for developing insights. And as a result, we're able to design systems that are more complicated for us to even model. But we designed them based on models. And so, and so that's something that engineers have done really well. And then on the parallel side, I think institutions, like economics and social scientists, have tried to understand policy. They have to understand markets, states. Again, some in a quantitative way that goes from data to models to insights. You know, general equilibrium theory is one example of that particular kind of thinking. And the point is that these two guys were working separately from each other. And they didn't need to interact with each other for the one reason is that they were operating at different time scales. So economists and social scientists, but build, that ones that build institutions. Okay. The, uh, the revolution that has happened in communication, in networking, that allowed each one of us with a handheld device be connected to the state of the system that we're working with, namely a transportation system, but possibly an economic system or a policy system that has been devised by an economist or a social scientist, changed that problem. Now the time scale that we're operating with is the same. And the decisions that are made at this level are impactful to the uh, well-being, the, the, the performance and robustness and resilience of the physical systems. And so what we need is, is sort of now to try to understand how do we connect these two components with each other, not in a very trivial way of saying, oh, you know, so here we have a general equilibrium model, and now here we have a whole bunch of differential equations, and let's figure out how to put them together. 
they don't mesh together. That doesn't work that way, right? So what is the, so why, you know, so one aspect is this time scale is really critical that now we're operating at the same time scale, but then there's another thing that made the analysis today possible that wasn't possible, I would say, maybe one or two decades ago. And I would say that, that that's the data. We couldn't collect data at the, at the level that we're doing today. Now where everything is instrumented, everything is possible to get, you can also buy data, as we will talk about it later. So I don't have to instrument everything. I can get data from other people who instrumented it. So we have a lot of data, and that data we have on the system that we build an actual engine, the actual grid or the actual transportation system. But also I have data on people and their behavior and their preferences and their choices. And I have data on, on policy and policy makers and so forth. I got a lot of data. The problem is, it's really important to remember is that having the data doesn't solve the problem. This data is heterogeneous. It's very different. Uh, uh, voltages and currents in the power grid are not the same as policies made in the Pentagon. Right? It's not the same apples and oranges. I mean, they are apples and oranges. And so having data is not sufficient. So that sometimes they're not time connected. The they're not all stamped at the same Time. So, you know, so things may be aggregate in one level, but not too aggregate in another level. So just data is a complicated thing. So it doesn't answer the question, but nevertheless, without it, you couldn't answer any questions. And so you have it now. So what are you going to do with it? Okay. And so what we need to do, what we've always done. And that is from the data, develop abstracted models. That's what the engineers in the past have been successful at. That's what we need to be able to do. Challenge is, how do we get these abstracted models? How do we understand them? So this is where work has to be done. A lot of work and thinking has to be done. But for any time you have models, now we have insights, and from the insights we can design decisions and we can analyze the various decisions. So that's where theory is really critical, and that's what I would say a lot of the emphasis now with the, our institute, but also kind of research that is happening today is trying to connect these components in a way where one can actually develop and talk about abstracted models. So I'm going to give you some examples of what we're doing, and um, yeah, and, and then lead to some conclusions. Um, so I want to focus on criti critical infrastructures, although what I'm talking about really extends to almost anything you want to talk about. You can talk about retail, you can talk about uh, um, the financial markets, I mean, it's in here, but you can talk more about uh, different types of uh, demands and, and so forth. Um, you can talk about um, fake news and, um, and the media and the propagation of stories. There's a lot of topics that you can talk about that are not that different from the message I'm, I'm delivering over here. But I'm going to focus on infrastructures because I think it's really critical, called critical infrastructures, and our life and comfort depends on the management of these types of infrastructures. So examples, energy, transportation, financial systems, although my talk will focus on transportation just because it's a little easier to, to deal with. Models are a little easier. But in all of these things, we have, we have a lot of physics that describe how things happen. A lot of them are flow networks, meaning that you know in the electricity there are elect the currents that are flowing in a network and they follow Kirchhoff laws and and so you have a way of understanding how these things move around, or you have people and goods that are moving in a network uh, of a transportation network and uh, decisions are being made at nodes, but once the decision is made, the flow is described by some sort of a differential equation. And so we ha also understand a lot of the dynamics of how these uh, things work. And similarly for the financial systems, although you know, maybe the, the type of mathematics that we use will be somewhat different, but in principle, these things are very similar to each other. Okay? So what's going on in the, in the world of a control theorist? Okay? That's my world. Well, there is this real world, okay, the real physical problems, and as I said, they can be financial, uh, uh, we, we can talk about finance, or we'll talk about transportation, or we'll talk about energy, and as I said, a lot of this stuff is governed by physical laws. Then we have people that interact with these systems. These systems are most robust when no one interacts with them. If nobody goes on the, on the streets, 
the, 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 the transportation system is very robust, you know? And so, but that's not the purpose. There's no, that's not the issue. So maximum robustness can be achieved by preventing anybody from doing anything. But this is why infrastructures are really important. We're trying to maximize what the utility of these infrastructures. We want more people to move around. We want more people to use electricity, but yet we want to maintain the resource that we have. That's the job of the control theorist. We sit right in the middle. We're supposed to think about the sensing, the communication, and control as a whole, and figure out how to regulate this whole complicated system. At the bottom part, what we do, we design the classical control strategies. That's we actually build control systems in the classical control system. There's feedback, kind of the you know, three, three described control system for the, for the uh, biological system, but this is, in general, our bread and butter, right? You know, you build control for power grid, you build control for the transportation system. So that's standard. But there's another part where we have to also incentivize and change the behavior of people. And that's non-standard. Because as a control theorist, I would say, if I want to, um, you know, if I build a thermostat, and I don't do that, but I suppose I build a thermostat, I actually expect it to do what I tell it to do. I write a code, and the code follows what, I'm, for the most part, follows what I said you should do. But for people, people don't follow what you tell them to do, right? In fact, every time you tell people to do something, they think what are the implications of that request, and they do the strategic thing which is, how do I, oh, okay, so he's telling us to turn right. He told everybody to turn right, I'm turning left. Because if everyone turned right, then there's a problem, I turn left, right? Strategic behavior always comes into, into this issue, and it kind of changes the game in terms of, literally a game, in terms of how you interact with these people, with the people behavior. So the job of a controls person is control at the physical component, but also providing incentive mechanisms or a, a, a mechanism of some sort that will make people behave in the way you would like them to behave. That's the, that's the complicated component, and that's something that I will allude to as I'm going to describe. But this is basically what the co-design problem that is becoming actually the focus of a lot of research that is ongoing. And I, I cannot claim that this problem has been solved. This problem is still open. There's a lot of interesting things to think about for the students in the audience. And I think that this is something where we need to go from here, right? I'm going to give you an example of uh, people behavior and what can happen. So this is a picture from the uh, network in Atlanta, um, uh, January 20, 2014. How many of you have been to Atlanta? OK. Atlanta is a nice city. Um, it rarely it rarely snows in Atlanta. It doesn't snow in Atlanta. Essentially, it doesn't snow in Atlanta. This is not a story about Boston, but it is true about Atlanta. But in this particular day, uh, Atlanta had three inches of snow. This much, okay? And um, actually, I, I will say that when we have three inches of snow in Boston, we, we don't call that snow. We say, oh, it's a great day today, you know? Yeah. <laughs> But three inches of snow in Atlanta resulted in massive hours of delays at the Atlanta airport and cascaded to three hour delay in LAX. And so the question is, why would, so I understand of course that maybe you know, Atlanta is not uh, prepared to even take care of three inches of snow in their transportation system, but why the delay in the airport? I mean, after all, the airport should have invested in at least one plow that can plow the runway and get everybody out. I mean, that's not a huge investment. Atlanta should have had a plow in there. Actually, Atlanta has a plow in the airport. So why was the delay in the airport? Guesses? Sarah? Yeah, people, yeah, the, exactly. You couldn't get the staff to run the airport from their homes to the airport. The delay, the, 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 trans the actual car network resulted in the delay in the airport, and then the airport cascaded. We know that airports cascade. I mean, the, the delays in airports is another very complicated but interesting question. So that brings, first of all, an understanding of the interconnectedness of these types of networks. They're not all operating separately from each other. They're very connected with each other, so of course. We knew that. 
why do we have this problem uh, every time it snows? Actually, we have that problem in Boston every time we have the, the first snowstorm that we get in the city. This thing happens, okay? There will be a prediction at 4 p.m. the snow is going to hit. We're going to get in Boston usually about a foot of snow. And then the mayor, sometime around 12, uh, decides, you know, we're going to shut down the city at 4 p.m. We're going to close the offices and everybody can go home. And now all the strategic thinkers go to business. 4 p.m., that means everybody's going to leave their work at 4 p.m. The, the roads are going to be uh, congested. I'm going to leave at 2. <laughs> Everybody leaves at 2. And we get the, the same problem. We get this congestion that will take many, many hours to clear. So the first problem is this panic behavior that causes a run, you know, and then everybody goes out. And then once you're out, what happened with the snow is that it actually changed the capacity of the roads. It reduced the capacity of the road. So that's a disruption across the different network. And by reducing the capacity, you of, co of course, you could reduce the flow. People, of course, make some decisions on the, on the way to go there, and that causes the amplification of this particular loss capacity. So this is the picture is that this actually, at, by 11 p.m., still the roads have not cleared in, uh, in Atlanta, when actually, in reality, when you look at, usually 5 p.m. looks like this is 2000, uh, 2014. Not 2019, actually, this, these pictures all change in Atlanta. Now it's a big congestion the whole time. But at 2014, uh, by, uh, 8 PM, by 8 p.m., it would have cleared. Okay, and so the contrast was actually large. So I'm going to give you just very quickly, and, and the reason I'm going through this painful exercise, just so that you all feel the pain, one, uh, which is important in every talk. If you don't feel the pain, you don't learn anything. Um, but also because I want to argue that at some level, physical modeling is going to be really important. And then I'll transi transition to talk about data. So I haven't yet said anything about data and collection of data. It's all about modeling, okay? So I have two issues, and I'm going to just kind of like run through them. One is the panic, okay? And I, you have to deal with the panic. You have to figure out how to stagger people so that they all, don't all decide to leave. Either you, by controlling the decision of saying, okay, people with odd license plate numbers can leave and, and even can leave the hour later, or by saying only people that have to pick up kids from schools can leave, or 